Good afternoon. I'm glad you all could come out. It's very gratifying to see such a large crowd. Uh, I have a few thank yous before I begin my talk. I'd like to thank you, Wigo, Stathi, Amra Bidis, and Bob Dunkel for putting on this tremendous uh, uh, symposium. Uh, it's long overdue. I also want to thank Esther Kirk. Uh, Esther Kirk is the wife of one of the DuSable swimmers, and uh, she contacted me um, last year or the year before last, and she made it possible for me to get the voices of the DuSable swimmers. I had done an earlier presentation of DuSable, but I never had their voices. I never had any contacts. Uh, she not only provided me the contacts, she provided me you know, um, with a, a, some marvelous photos that um, helps illustrate the talk uh, tremendously. And um, uh, the little presentation that you saw uh, with the, I think Sam Cook singing, uh, most, all, I think all those photos came from Esther Kirk as well. Okay, this is a story of an all black high school in Chicago, the Sabo which for some 15 years from the late 1930s to the early 1950s earned plaudits in the city's black community as a swimming power. The team's success in these years belied some common stereotypes and prejudices long held in American society concerning African Americans and swimming. Before we get to this story, however, it is important to review the context in which it's being told and give a look at popular and academic perceptions, true and false, related to the subject of African Americans and the sport of swimming. In 2006, the Journal of American History ran a fascinating article by Kevin Dawson, Enslaved Swimmers and Divers of the Atlantic World. The author un uncovered a wealth of information from explorers to plantation owners uh, uh, of the 18th and 19th centuries on the superb swimming and diving abilities of black people in both Africa and America. And if you were here for uh, Professor Dawson's uh, presentations, you heard, heard a wealth of information. Dawson wrote an epilogue to his paper in which he raised the question that with all this previous evidence of black proficiency in swimming in slave owning days, what can explain the perception today by both blacks and whites, that swimming, swimming is simply not a black sport. Dawson started with Al Capanis' infamous interview on Ted Koppel's Nightline show in April of 1987, when the LA Dodgers vice president made the comment that blacks, quote, may not have some of the necessities to be a field manager or perhaps a general manager, end quote. He shortly followed with the comment quote, why are black people not good uh, swimmers? Because they don't have the buoyancy, end quote. <laughs> Campanas was not the only person to have this perception about a supposed biological impediment for blacks in swimming. Martin Kane in the Sports Illustrated article from 1971 also suggested that the historically poor showing of blacks uh, in swimming, or in the modern world of swimming, um, could well be a result of lack of buoyancy. Other articles in the late 60s and early 70s likewise discussed African Americans swimming and the buoyancy issue. These studies have since been discredited and are referred collectively uh, as the buoyancy myth. Of particular interest were the comments of Malachi Cunningham, Jr., a swimming coach of an African American team in Philadelphia. He concluded that whether or not Buoyancy was a factor in the low interest and performance of blacks in swimming. Something, quote, something had to be done to offer swimming to a larger segment of the black community, end quote. Very, very good comments. Kane interviewed famed Indiana coach Doc Councilman, who downplayed the buoyancy factor and cited instead the lack of opportunity that had been afforded blacks in swimming. Historically, in black neighborhoods, Swimming facilities have been less abundant than in white communities. Famed physical educator and sport historian, a great sport historian, by the way, Edwin Bancroft Henderson, 
would write occasional letters to DC newspapers faulting the District of Columbia for its lack of swimming facilities for African Americans. In recent years, many blacks, who tend to be of more modest means, have been shut out from the top end of swimming competition with the rise of expensive private swim clubs designed to give year-round training for the development of Olympic competitors. Uh, more importantly, historically, public swimming facilities have been often barred to blacks, particularly in the South, but certainly all too common in the North. The Chicago Defender is replete with decades worth of stories from both the South and the North over racial conflict engendered by the breaking of barriers on the, or the attempt to break barriers in the use of swimming facilities. The worst Chicago race riot in its history in 1919 erupted over a black youth transgressing the segregated space that whites had created over the water on the Lake Michigan beach. Historically, blacks have not done well in swimming, that is, in the modern era, and this is considered a health issue by the U.S. government's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Drowning, st drowning statistics for 2002-2003 showed that drowning rate for African-American children ages 5 to 19 years was 2.3 times the rate of white children. The National Center attributed this to higher african American rate of drowning to a widespread lack of swimming ability in the black community. A look at blog comments on those statistics show two common assertions why blacks do not swim. The lack of interest and opportunity on the part of African Americans and the lack of buoyancy on the part of blacks. Some of the assertions were blatantly racist. That reputed lack of intelligence among blacks lowered their survival strategies in water and that black parents were less conscientious in supervising their children. Altogether, whether the assertions are true or false, racist or non-racist, the common perception today is that most African Americans do not like to swim, are sinkers, and they have less swimming ability. Likewise, the widespread view is that blacks are not engaged in competitive swimming and the perception gets disseminated throughout our popular culture. In 1991, in an episode of the Situation Comedy, Designing Women, we have this exchange on blacks and swimming between the characters called Bernice and Anthony. Bernice, you know there's something else you don't see much of these days, black swimmers. Why is that, Anthony? Anthony. Well, because black people are too smart to get involved in swimming because there is no future in it. No one has ever swum their way out of the ghetto. Believe me, if it was possible to make $5 million a year as a professional swimmer, it wouldn't be Air Jordan, it would be River Jordan. <laughs> as you can see, the subject of black com competitive swimming has become a punchline material for situation comedy. Okay. As a result of these society perceptions, the DeSalvo story falls into a certain narrative in writing about black achievement in swimming. What writers have been doing to counter the widespread notion that African Americans do not want to swim, cannot swim, is to show a black swim program that belies those suppositions. In, in his 1989 book Necessities, for example, Arthur Philip M. Hoos, in his ironically titled chapter, Buoyancy tells the story of the successful all-black Barracuda Swim Club from Cleveland in 2008. A motion picture called Pride told of another successful black swimming club program in inner city Philadelphia. There are many more of these narratives, and a representative and notable one was Dedeke Sabo High from 1935 to 1952. DuSable's competitive swimming program was certainly not unique when it began in the 30s. Elsewhere on the interscholastic level, the segregated schools of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. had been competing since 1929. Many of the Negro colleges had strong swimming programs, and beginning in 1948, the Colored Intercollegiate Athletic Association began conducting an annual tournament. DuSable High opened its doors in the fall of 1935 in the heart of Chicago's Black South Side. 
The high school was built with a swimming pool and its athletic department immediately instituted an, an ambitious swimming program under coach William T. Mackey. He was born on September 16, 1907, attended De La Salle Institute and swam competitively for the Hyde Park YMCA. He received his higher education at the YMCA's George Williams College and Northwestern University. Mackey introduced a 10-mile swimming marathon for the DuSable swim team. In this program, each student swam so many lengths of the 60-foot pool, pool every day until they reached nine and three-quarter miles. Then in the last quarter mile, they would compete in a race for their positions on the team. Graduates of the 10-mile marathon who finished first, second, or third would use that achievement to try out as lifeguards for the Chicago Park District to work at, at, sw at swimming venues in the black community, notably Washington Park Pool, the Wabash Avenue YMCA, and the 31st Street Beach on Lake Michigan. Uh, unlike the South, these weren't legally segregated uh, facilities, uh, they were socially segregated. Uh, all, all, all people of all stripes were welcome to any of these facilities. The 10 mile marathon program helped immensely to build a competitive swim team at the school, no doubt what Mackey intended. The team practiced every afternoon and on Tuesdays and Thursdays had an extra practice at 8 a.m. Reflective of the hard practices that coach put the team through, the team adopted the name Seahorses. The school's comp competition in its first year was with non-school team, notably y Wabash YMCA and Boys Club, both local black institutions. No doubt a racial issue was involved, as many white high school teams then shunned competition with a black school. Meanwhile, another Chicago school, Lane Tech, emerged as a swimming power about the same time under coach John Newman. Lane was the technical school for the entire north side of the city, and by the early 1940s, about 7,000 to 7,500 students attended the school, all male. Each year, Newman had the pick of some 2,000 freshman boys enrolled in the swim classes. DuSable, in contrast, had traditional enrollment boundaries for both boys and girls, with a total enrollment of about 3,500 to 4,000 students. So there, was, there, so there was hardly 2,000 boys in the entire school. DuSable's success in swimming began with an undefeated dual meet season, beginning a streak of 53 dual meet victories that lasted until 1943. The Chicago Defenders started giving DuSable headlines in February meat string reached 23 straight. The streak became a recurring story in the paper. While obviously a laudable achievement, DeSalvo never had dual meat competition with any of the top area teams, notably Lane Tech in Chicago and New Trier in the suburbs. The lack of this top-notch competition could have been due both to racism and to other factors, such as the isolation of DuSalvo from suburban competition. Racism was no doubt a strong factor. All the other schools that competed against DeSalvo were essentially white high schools in the city, which to their credit overcame prevailing racist views of the day. Lane Tech during these years emerged as a top team in the state, winning the state championship nine out of 10 years from 1938 through 1947. School by the late 30s overwhelmingly dominated the Chicago Public League twice yearly league meets, held respectively in December and April. Uh, Chicago schools, some had 20-yard pools, some had 25-yard uh, pools, so um, uh, they had separate competitions. The 20-yard competition was held in December, and the 25-yard competition was held in April. Rarely was Lane Tech challenged for these twice yearly titles. But one school did, Dusable but it would take a while. Racism in Chicago public schools brought the issue of the Sable swim team competing with other schools to a boil in November of 1941. The league's program was based on just the December and April all, uh, all schools meet, by which no school was barred. 
Dual meets among the schools were conducted on their own on an invitational home and away basis. But the dual meet competition could be somewhat intermittent. Thus, many of the swimming coaches on the south side felt the need for more regular competition that, and decided to form a dual meet league. These schools include five predominantly white, one majority African American high school, as well as the virtually all black Phillips and DuSable high schools. Some of the coaches of these schools had resisted uh, scheduling DuSable in the past and were not willing to let Phillips and DuSable into the newly formed league. The Chicago Defender reported, quote, there has been rumors that although Phillips, although Phillips and DuSable will invite teams to their ranks, few invitations to go to other schools in Chicago will be extended to them. The crux of the whole thing is that these coaches, not the boys, don't want competition against Negro swimmers, end quote. One of the most vir virulent coaches against competition with DuSable and Phillips was ironically the Englewood coach who apparently was leading an all-white team in a high school that was nearly 60% black. Uh, a few weeks later, however, the Chicago Board of Education put an end to the, quote, Lily White Swim League, end quote, as the Chicago Defender headlined. This flare-up, I think, opened a window to what the Sabo faced each year in fielding a swimming team and finding competition. DuSable was highly competitive with high school teams that did face, and during this time produced some top flight swimmers, such as Fred Lida, Wesley Ward, and Jack Hall. In February 1942, the Seahorses bested the Farragut team 45 to 22 for his 42nd straight dual meet victory. In February 1943, the team beat Harrison team 42 to 24 for his 53rd straight dual meet win. A few days after the meet, Coach Mackey was inducted into the Army. Uh, there, was no, there was no more reports of a dual meet string. With Mackey's absence, DuSable continued to field the team, but without the same rigorous training. The 10-mile marathon program, for instance, was abandoned. In the 1945-46 season, Coach Mackey returned to DuSable. He reinstituted the 10-mile marathon and soon brought the school to even greater prominence in the Chicago swim world. The first two years, he lost a few contests, but in the 1947-48 season, the school went undefeated in dual meets and won the championship of the central section. By this time, the Board of Education had instituted dual meet leagues to supplement the fall and spring meets. DuSable repeated as central section champs the next year. Yet in the citywide meets, Lane Tech was still dominant. DuSable was competing regularly against predominantly white schools at this time, but there was no published reports of hostility or resistance from schools as in earlier years. Most of the DuSable swimmers I interviewed did not see any conflict or sense any animosity, commented former DuSable star Eddie Kirk, quote, we knew them and they got to know us pretty well. It was just like a group of fellows getting together and swimming. That's one of the things I feel real comfortable with. Because whenever I went during the summer to the Chicago Tribune meet, uh, earlier this morning, um, uh, one of the presenters uh, showed all his uh, uh, souvenirs, and one of them was the, uh, a little badge from the Chicago Tribune uh, meet that uh, Eddie Kirk mentioned. Anyway, uh, uh, the Chicago Tribune meet, the Herald American meet, and a couple of AAU meets, it seems as though I was welcome everywhere I went, end quote. Star breaststroker Don, Donald Clark recalled, I can honestly say that with regard to the guys we competed against, we never had any racial incidents that I recall. In fact, back then, I received a lot of compliments from my competitors. I was spurred on by a lot of fellows on the white team, end quote. On the other hand, when I asked Kirk's and Clark's teammate, Floyd Billy Ray, but whether he had sensed any hostilities at the white schools, he replied, oh yeah, and asserted that he heard names yelled at the team when their bus pulled up 
to the school, but said, quote, after we won the meet, they didn't call us nothing, end quote. <laughs> Bill, Bill Mackey is fondly remembered by the swimmers of this period as an excellent coach, and they gave a number of reasons. Related Kirk, quote, he had high expectations that he wanted you to meet, he made sure you did the work to achieve those goals, end quote. Diver Leon Geis added, quote, Coach Mackey taught us a lot of things about swimming that we didn't know coming up. Uh, and, he, and he was interested in getting us involved in different competitions during the school year, end quote. Added breaststroker Clark, quote, he would explain things to you. Mackey has shown me how to do a radical new turn with the flip over. This was questioned at a meet, but he got them to accept the maneuver. I thought he was a heck of a coach, end quote. Backstroker Jerome Merritt commented, quote, everyone on the team liked him. He was very interesting, very fine coach, just an all right, all around nice guy, end quote. The success in swimming that DeSalvo was experiencing in these years was not only due to the training regimen imposed by the coach, the swimmers he had were highly dedicated to swimming and augmented their in-school training outside the school. I think this is very important. They did a lot of extra work. Team Captain Eddie Kirk worked as a lifeguard at the Wabash YMCA several evenings each week. Said he, quote, there were seven of us and I was bringing the fellows in at least two or three times a week practicing in the pool. And that's what helped us along a little bit because we were like doing double practice, end quote. Kirk also served as unofficial assistant coach and worked with the swimmers on their strokes and training. Uh, diver Lloyd Otten also succeeded, who succeeded Kirk as captain, proudly recalled taking the team to the YMCA on Christmas vacation and training every day during the break. Don Clark did not participate in the group outside practices, but got a lot of training on his own at Washington Park. Two of the lifeguards there were his cousins, Wayman Ward and Wesley Ward, the latter, DuSable's top swimmer in 1941, who took interest in developing their young cousin, said Clark, quote, when I went to go swimming in Washington Park, they made me practice going up and down the pool. That's how I built up speed, end quote. Diver Leon Geis first learned to swim in the Washington Park pool and in his early teens was introduced to diving there. He saw a one-time national AAU diving champion, Dorothy Ziegler, train, training for, the, for an AAU competition at the pool. Ziegler was also on the same Catholic youth organization, CYO team, as Eddie Kirk, Lloyd Austin, and other DeSable swimmers. Said guys, quote, Dorothy Ziegler was a great influence on me in diving. She would come to the pool and work out and I would watch her. After she finished working out, I would go, I would get on the board and try to imitate what she had done. After the competition, she would come back on her own and regularly coach me on the various aspects of diving techniques." End quote. Guys passed on what he learned from Ziegler to fellow diver Lloyd Austin. The two would do pairs diving Ex exhibitions at Washington Park Pool, where in after hours they would practice their dives. The two soon became great point producers for DuSable teams in the next couple of years. The DuSable swimmers were going beyond most of their competitors at rival schools by putting in considerable training outside the school. These extra practices not only helped the team become better swimmers, but undoubtedly helped to bond the team together. Quote, uh, we worked together as a whole and did things together, uh, uh, end quote, related Kirk. Quote, like at the YMCA and continue to do that for the next two or three years. We never had much money and we have to walk each other home in the dead of winter after the pra practice sessions. And, at, and as time went on, the team got stronger and stronger, end quote. The DuSable Seahorses were now ready for the great showdown against the powerhouse Lane Tech team in December 1949. Oh, you got it. 
In the 20-year public league meet in December 1949, DuSable had his best ever opportunity to overtake the Lane Tech team. DuSable was loaded. The Chicago defender, whose sports writer, Chuck Davis, was following the team, understood that DuSable had a genuine chance of ending Lane Tech's 14-year string of 20-year titles. The day before the finals of the meet, the Chicago defender valued DuSable's chances in a sizable story on a large headline. Quote, DuSable girds to upset Lane in the tank meet, end quote. Lane Tech qualified seven individuals and one relay team for the finals compared to DuSable's five individuals and two relay teams. Thus, the two teams were evenly matched in the finals, and clearly DuSable was posed for an incredible upset. But the mainstream papers did not take notice. The primary narrative of the preliminaries was that Lane Tech was favored to continue his string of titles. The Chicago Sun-Times said that, and the Chicago Tribune both listed the number of qualifiers of, of each team, yet the write-ups automatically assumed Lane Tech as the favorite. Nothing was mentioned about how DeSable just might have the horses this time to beat Lane Tech. But that was not the story of the mainstream newspapers. Lane won the Tech, won the meet, but it was the closest outcome in a couple of decades, with Lane Tech edging DeSable by just five points, 46 to 41. Now, belatedly, the theme of the mainstream newspapers was that DuSable had been a genuine threat to take the title from Lane, said the Herald American. Quote, DuSable puts a scare in the Lane seniors, end quote, said the Chicago Daily News. The Lane Tech squad was hard pressed by DuSable to win the, their title, end quote. The Chicago Defender followed the next week with a story lamenting the loss and the bad breaks in the meet. Uh, Leon Geis was uh, previous years champion, he, he took second. And for example, uh, he was expected to take first, but second's pretty good. But um, there was other little things that. DeSalvo's results in the 25 yard meet in the spring of 1950 were not too shabby either. With the school taking second with 33 points to Lane Tech's 45 points. Eddie Kirk that year took home the only medal the school ever won in the state meet winning the individual medley in the annual March meet. The 1949-50 school year thus represented the high watermark of DuSable's achievement in swimming, so to speak. Now we're going to get into the question of race. There was no commentary in the mainstream dailies on the fact that DuSable was an all-black team that nearly beat the mighty all-white Lane Tech team. The Chicago Defender only briefly touched on it and Chuck Davis offered some commentary in his column. He said, one of the sports most neglected by Negro high school boys, and collisions too, for that matter, is swimming. Tennessee State, West Virginia State, and Howard, to mention you have facilities for a top flight aquatic program, but for some reason the sport has not clicked. End quote. Davis continued his commentary by attributing the success of DeSable's team to the 10-mile marathon that Coach Mackey had been conducting during his tenure. Davis also uh, attributed the traditional lack of swimming success by other black schools to lack of interest and lack of tough training. Davis all overlooked that the school was producing top divers at, at, at this time as well. Leon Geis won the city's diving championship in the spring 49 meet and took second in, in in the fall 1949 meet. In the spring and fall meets of 1950, Lloyd Otten cop second both, uh, both times. With the 1950-51 school year, DuSable again has had a successful season. The school took the central section for the fourth consecutive year and managed to, to take second in the annual 20-yard meet. But its 14 points bear, hardly challenged Lane Tech's 42 points. A bit more glory was rendered to DuSable with the publication of the Amateur Swimming Guide in early 1951. Eddie Kirk was named to the 1950 All-American Interscholastic Team. Um, I didn't 
I, I, in my paper, I never made the claim it was the first because I, I wasn't familiar with all the, 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 the All-American teams that were selected, but I'm going to take Bruce Wigo's work that uh, Eddie Kirk was the first African-American to win this achievement. At that time, the Chicago Defender was no, noted that the school's dual meet record was 108 victories to only 11 defeats. The spring 25-yard meet saw the Sabo drop to fourth place. The program was in decline. Despite all the success it enjoyed, the Sabo faced much resistance by many of its students to swimming. I talked to a former student of Mackey, James Brown, uh, who while not on the swim team, took a swim class under Mackey in, in the early 1950s. Brown already knew how to swim, which he had learned at Park District Pools but he noted that many of his fellow classmates did not and thus resisted the swim instruction. He said, quote, Coach Mackey would make them get into the water, but they really didn't want to. You could tell the ones who didn't want to swim, they stayed in the shallow end, uh, shallow water all the time. The ones who didn't want to swim had to go to ROTC. Brown <laughs> laughed on the ROTC comment. Students at Chicago high schools at the time could, to, could participate in ROTC in lieu of their physical education classes. Kirk noted the fear of many African Americans to water, relating, well, I guess some parents had some bad experience in the water or something, and, and what happened, they be, begin to try to protect their kids. They say, quote, don't go near the water, stay away from the water. This is from the south all the way up to north. That's one reason blacks do. It's an old proverb or whatever. They, they just created a fear of water, end quote. On the other hand, Donald Clark noted, quote, I don't believe the assertion that blacks do not like to swim. I grew up in the neighborhood of 49th and Prairie, which is about four blocks from the Sable High School. I had a lot of friends, and every one of them could swim every one of them. They couldn't compete like at the level that was going on at the time in the high schools, but they could swim adequately, end quote. The 1951-52 season marks the last time DeSalvo garnered any kind of league-wide achievement in swimming. When it took second to Lane Tech in the annual 20-yard meet, earning 17, 17 points to Lane Tech's 34 points. Thereafter, DeSalvo was no longer a factor in the city City swim meets. In 1954, the school basketball team, the Panthers, took second in the state. This began a tradition where not only outsiders saw DeSalvo as purely a basketball power, but so did the school. Said Floyd Billy Ray, quote, the swimmers were no longer coming out for the team. After DuSable's basketball team went downstate to play in the championship game in 1954, none of the students wanted to swim. They wanted to play basketball, end quote. Donald Clark sadly noted, quote, I hate to say it, but Coach Mackey just did not have the guys who were willing to put in the work. And maybe the coach was tired of staying on the rear ends, end quote. By the 1960s, DuSable was fielding swim teams only intermittently and 1972 marks the last year that DuSable sponsored a, a swim team. With no swim team, the school today sadly reflects the stereotype that African Americans are not interested in swimming and probably are not good at it either. Of all the DuSable swimmers I interviewed, Eddie Kirk had the best post high school swimming career and only one that competed in college. He went on to Tennessee State on a swim scholarship he later went into the Army where he qualified to be one of the four from the Army to be uh, on the Armed Forces team that competed internationally in the Moor, Belgium. He won a medal there. He returned to Chicago and worked two jobs at the post office and the Park District, the latter where he worked until he retired in 1992. He coached many swimmers and water polo players. Taught hundreds of lifeguards over the year that worked at many Southside pools. Moving to Florida in retirement, 
He coached at Brandon Swim and Tennis Club with Peter Banks and for high schools, other cl clubs, and the YMCA. Coach William T. Mackey, after the 1956 season, gave up coaching the swim team to move up to the chairman of the boys' physical education department. He left the school after the 1965 season to serve as athletic director of the Chicago Board of Education. He retired in 1970 and died in Denver, Colorado in February 1981. This narrative is filled with ironies. During the years of DeSable's tremendous success in the Chicago Public League program, it was only a story in the Chicago Defender. The Defender recognition was typical of the day, in which African-American publications were dedicated to telling their readers the achievements and exploits of the race. The Chicago mainstream papers did not seem to notice the story, and presumably took it for granted that DeSable could achieve in swimming as much as any other school. There was not the unstated attitude then that was remarkable for blacks to swim. The school, in the eyes of the public then, was not disproving the popular prejudices of the day regarding African Americans and swimming, although, in fact, it was. DuSable swimmer Donald Clark, whose memories may be colored by the present, saw DuSable's achievement in racial terms, saying, quote, there was some there's another one. Yes, I forgot. Okay. There was some kind of belief that African Americans could not swim because they had large bones and couldn't float good. I used to hear that myth all the time. I think the success we had to solve will disprove that. End quote. The basic truth that comes out in this story is that to solve the swimmers succeeded not only because they had a good coach, because they worked harder than opposing teams, practiced more and learning more in off school hours. Oh wait, no, no. Uh, I'm a member of NASH, and we have a postmodern historian at NASH. That's the North American Society for Sport History. His name is Doug Booth. He's an Australian. And um, he asks historians to think reflectively on what they're talking about, what they present. In other words, um, to give a little reflection on what the story means in terms of themselves. And um, I'm going to be a little reflective. Another irony is in this very presentation, which by making to solve high achievements, a quote, a remarkable story, end quote, as in the title, it appears to contain the racially insensitive assumption that it is remarkable that these African Americans can swim competitively. Another irony is that this DuSable narrative exists in 2012, but back in the 1940s, precisely because of what happened in the last few decades in the black community where African Americans appear to show less interest in swimming than in the past. Lastly, the story of DuSable's swim program should be understood in the context of sport history, which in its narratives on race have been inordinately and long devoted to the strictly empirical recovery of the missing history of African-American achievement. The DuSable swim program and the great athletes it produced in the late 40s and early 50s should now be deemed, quote, recovered, end quote. Thus constituting an important legacy of African-American achievement in swimming history that we should forever remember and recognize. The end.